<clears throat> All right, well, I'll start now since it's 12.01, and as usual, I have a lot to say in today's presentation. Um, welcome to everybody, and uh, I'm Jane Eliasoff. I'm the director of the Montclair History Center, and this is our 13th, I believe, program that we've been doing on Thursdays during um, our shutdown. As many of you know, we're a small not-for-profit. Like all small not-for-profits, we're struggling during this. Um, and so if you see it in your heart and have the capability to give us a donation, it would be very much appreciated. Um, several ways to do it. You can either go online to our website, montclairhistory.org, and click on membership or donate. Um, you can do it on Venmo. If you're on Venmo, just look for Montclair History Center. Um, my name will pop up, but it is the Montclair History Center. And um, finally, you can do it by sending a check to us, very simply, 108 Orange Road, Montclair, New Jersey, 07042. And I really wanna thank you all for your generosity uh, because we have received some donations and memberships uh, that I know can be directly tra traced to this programming. So I really, really appreciate it. But even more important, I'm really thrilled that we're able to keep our mission alive during this and deliver history into your homes. So um, unless I'm missing anything, I think I'm ready to begin my presentation, which is uh, Montclair in the 1890s. And before um, you are all muted, um, I am just going to ask you to throw out there, either in the chat room or just vocally, what are some of the things that makes Montclair so special to you? What are, what are some of the attributes that um, really make a difference to you? And what are the reasons you may have really uh, latched on to Montclair in some way, shape, or form? The houses. The houses. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've been in my house 44 years. I walk every night. I see something different, something new every night. Excellent. Amazing. Okay. Beautiful old homes. And the gardens, of course. And the gardens. <laughs> okay. What else? The school Green system. Line. School. <laughs> Somebody else had something else. Tree line streets. Tree line streets. Okay. When I moved here, the Encyclopedia Britannica said that Montclair had more trees per square acre than any <laughs> other place in the United States. Wow. I don't know how good that is today. But <laughs> That's why we have a tree ordinance. <laughs> how about accessibility? Accessibility. You can go to the mountains, to the shore, you can go to the city, country. You don't have to drive far to get to anything. Yep. And before this pandemic, it was just a lot that you can do every day and every night. Lots mm -hmm. to do. Cultural from, things, too. From the chat room, people are talking about diverse restaurants. That would be part of that. Um, lots of things to do. And also, if your family history is here. Ah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in Montclair can trace their roots back many, many years. The people in the creative nature. Pam, what were you going to say? Oh, that's it. His okay. family history. Off. Of course, I grew up there too. So, <laughs> all right. Well, I one more uh, Jane Parks. Parks. Okay. So I first did this presentation when Grace Presbyterian approached me and asked me if I would come and um, talk about uh, what Montclair was like in 1892, because that was one of that was the year that they were founded, and they sort of wanted to get that context as part of their anniversary celebration. So I did. Um, but as I did more and more research, I really began to realize that in the 1890s, it reflected a time of great transition in Montclair. It was a time when um, we really, I mean, we always talk about how we transitioned from the agricultural community before the trains to the agricultural community or to the more suburban community after the trains. But I discovered that so much of that was happening in um, the 1890s that I decided to expand the focus of that presentation and actually sort of repackage it um, so that I could talk more about how Montclair really uh, became the Montclair that we know and love today. And so many of the seeds of that were planted back in the 1890s. Um, so today we're focusing uh, pretty much Montclair in the 1890s. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what was going on nationally. I'll touch on a little bit of what was happening before, a little bit what was happening afterwards. And some of the dates in here, um, you'll notice there may be some differences in what you know, if you know them. Um, and that's because of the many different history books that we have for Montclair, 
there's often a day, a year or two difference in them. So it gives you a rough estimation, not necessarily if you were to go back to their founding charter, what you would see. Um, so some fun facts in the early 90s before we really get into Montclair itself, but I just thought this was kind of a curious way to set the mood. Um, the Wright brothers opened their first bicycle shop um, in um, uh, the 1892. Frank Lloyd Wright opened up his own firm um, in 1893, 1894. Um, the first Pledge of Allegiance was the first time it was ever done. It was written in 1892 and originally published that same year. Um, note it didn't have the under God in there. That didn't happen until the 1950s. Um, this is Lizzie Borden, um, and as you know, she gave her mother 40 wax. Uh, she was uh, supposedly, she was acquitted, however, in 1892. This is Alice Sanger. Um, she became the first female Washington staffer, which I thought was interesting. She was appointed by Benjamin Harrison in 1890. She was a stenographer, and in the only reason Harrison did it was because his wife urged him to do that, which I thought was great. Um, and then finally, basketball was invented. Um, it was originally invented in Springfield, Massachusetts, where the Basketball Hall of Fame currently is. And it was part of a class assignment for the YW, YMCA um, in that area. But more broadly, we can look at, my, um, at the 1890s as the, what's known as the Gilded Age. Um, think of Vanderbilt's uh, little 70-room cottage in Newport that he used for the summer. That's basically what we're talking about when we talk about the Gilded Age. Um, and um, it was coined by Mark Twain. And we think of it with this kind of image. But Mark Twain was thinking of it as two-sided. You have this beautiful glittering surface, but then underneath there were some things that were not quite so beautiful. Um, um, before we get to the underbelly, however, let's look a little bit more positively. It was a formative period in America. Um, the ag agricultural society was being transformed into the urban society that we know today. And with that, the small producers, like farmers um, and people that cater to just the people in their neighborhood, was being transformed into uh, a society that was dominated by industrial corporations. And Montclair did mirror this trend. By the late 19th century, the industrial economy that had started earlier that century was in full swing. Um, and new technologies were all the rage. Alexander Graham Bell won the first U.S. patent for the telephone in 1876. Edison filed for the electric lamp in 1879. And Carl Benz patented his motor wagon in 1886. So these technologies, along with the expansion of earlier ones, led to even more um, improved transportation and communication. Trains could now go over 100 miles an hour, which I find remarkable. They delayed more than 70,000 miles of railway um, throughout the United States in the 1880s. And the corporation was really the dominant form of business. Um, and the railroad was an essential element of that uh, new business. And a select few, um, like the Vanderbilts, were making money hand over fist. Um, and that's where the corruption, the conspicuous consumption, and the capitalism step in. Um, and the Sherman Antitrust Act is passed in 1890 as a way to regulate business um, and to uh, ensure that there was some economic competition in the marketplace. Uh, but there was a lot more that was happening nationally in the 1890s as well that had a direct impact on Montclair. Reconstruction following the Civil War had failed. Um, Reconstruction, um, as you probably know, was implemented by Congress in 1866, right after the Civil War. And the goal was to try and figure out how to live um, with two races in a non-slave society. So it gave um, the Union, it gave the Southern states a way to re-enter the Union. Um, it also defined uh, rules that allowed um, white and black people to live together safely. And it gave men, black men, the right to vote, notice not women. Um, but the South was clearly not in favor of it. It only lasted until about 1877 
with the election of Rutherford B. Hayes, and at that point, it was it was basically over. Um, by the 1890s, um, there was not even a pretense in the South that the two races could live together equally in harmony. Um, and so the first Jim Crow laws are passed. Um, they were designed to limit freedom um, for the uh, uh, former enslaved workers. They reduced interracial contact. Um, you may have heard of the people who had to walk um, if you were walking on the same sidewalk, if you were black, you had to cross the street and walk on the other side. And if you um, didn't follow these rules, you could be taken into prison, which formed a newly incarcerated um, workforce um, that lasted for many years. There's a great video that's out by PBS called Slavery by Another Name that you might wanna take a um, look at if you're interested in that, that part of history. You also begin to get the separate but equal laws passed. So in Tennessee in 1891, they actually passed legislation saying that all rail cars should have um, separate accommodations for the white and colored races by providing two or more passenger cars for each passenger train or by dividing the cars by a partition. Um, they also began to find ways to deny the right to vote to African-American people. And they did that with literal, literacy tests, poll taxes, and elaborate registration systems. And we see that a lot in the South um, in the early civil rights, in the, not early civil rights, but in the um, you know, 1940s, 1950s. But it had a dramatic effect because in 1896 in Louisiana, there were 130,000 votes cast by African-American voters. And by 1904, that had dropped to just 1,342. Um, and so the Great Migration began. Um, the for people who were formerly enslaved or their descendants moved north to try and find a life away from Jim Crow and one that offered better opportunities than sharecropping. And they followed these paths. Um, this is, a, if you're looking for other reading on this, Warmth of Other Suns by, I believe it's Isabella Wilkerson. And she um, wrote a book that followed three families along each of these paths. You can see that a lot came up to our area through the Eastern Corridor. And today, um, if you talk to some of the um, African-American people who still live in town, they are descendants of those early uh, people who came up from Loudoun and Fauquier counties in um, Northern Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. The, according to Elizabeth Shepard, the 1870 census was the first census conducted after Montclair was incorporated. And at that time, there were only 36 African Americans in Montclair, most of whom were born in New Jersey with only a few born in Virginia, North Carolina, and Louisiana. Um, four of the families had their own homes and the remaining were live-in laborers and servants. By 1885, that number had increased from 36 to 250. And by 1900, there were 1,344 um, African Americans living in Montclair, which represented about 10% of Montclair's population. We also have an influx of uh, immigrants. And of course, the earliest settlers were immigrants as well, the Dodds, the Cranes, the Pearsons coming from England. But in the mid 1800s, with that first, um, first circle, you can see that it followed, Montclair's immigration followed the trends of national immigration. So you have a lot of people coming from, from Germany, from Ireland, and in Montclair, although it's not represented here, um, we had a, um, a number of Swedish folks coming over as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, by the um, late 1800s, that shifts a bit, and we begin to see more and more people coming from Italy, um, Russia, and Hungary. Um, in Montclair, we particularly see it coming from Italy, many from the hometown of Lacedonia, which if you um, look at the Italy as a boot, it's sort of right about the middle of the ankle. And there were so many coming that of course, Ellis Island was built and opened in 1892 to accommodate the huge influx. So you have this huge dichotomy going on. You've got the, the glitterata uh, in Newport and in the beautiful houses on Upper Mountain. Um, but you also have um, the new immigrants who have come over and are living in relative poverty in the tenements in the Lower East Side, very often in crowded um, one-room homes. So we also have the emergence of the new woman. Um, and this is particularly among women in the middle and upper classes 
following the American Rev Ancestral Revolution, um, they found they had more time, particularly now that they had inexpensive labor available, um, both the immigrant population and the migrant population coming from the South. And so they realized they could do more than run a household. Um, the, term, the term new woman takes hold. Um, women are moving into the public uh, with greater opportunities for education. This is when you begin to see women going off to colleges public involvement and social work, and you see this in Montclair just as much as you see it nationally. Um, there were a few acceptable outlets at the time. Obviously, the one was in the home as um, sort of the purveyor of um, all goodness and um, values and teaching the children the right way to be um, in the churches and the works that they did. Um, social work, um, and charity organizations such as Settlement Houses and the Red Cross. And if you were really daring, you could get involved in suffrage. So Montclair in the uh, 1890s reflects sort of a confluence of all of these things coming together. Um, we, with the new train coming through, we now have houses that are being built because of that accessibility that we mentioned earlier. You can now get to Hoboken pretty quickly. Um, we also uh, begin to need architects and builders to, uh, to build those houses. And um, the Osborne and Marcellus quarry was started um, to pull brownstone and trap rock from First Mountain um, used for roads as well as um, the houses and some of the churches. Um, interestingly, when you look at the um, Montclair Times from this period, um, everything that the township is doing at the time is all about uh, building roads, uh, making it bigger. Um, and the streets, the businesses are getting more crowded. Um, they are no longer a sleepy community, but now you have buildings like this on Bloomfield Avenue that's still there today. And we even had um, two of our own female physicians. Um, this is um, Emily Blackwell, uh, who was head of one of the colleges in New York City for women, uh, for women physicians, and also Stella Bradford. So Montclair was really beginning to experience some of these changes that we've seen um, throughout the rest of the United States. Um, this is Montclair, a map of it in the in 1857, and um, you can see this is it a little bit bigger. Uh, just blow it up so you can see the lot sizes. Uh, this is what is today South Mountain. This is Orange Road. Um, so there really were just you know a couple of houses and and homeowners there. Uh, very little um, development in this community. Then when you go to 1889, um, which is you know a number of years later, you can begin to see that same area now has got more streets cut through. Um, Upper Montclair, however, remains pretty um, undeveloped. It did stay as a farmland longer than Montclair proper did. And then this is 1904, and you can see that at this point now, um, Upper Montclair is equally as developed. So. Um, we're really, during that period from that 1857 map until the uh, 1904 map, you can really see the difference in development. Um, this is a view of Montclair from First Mountain in 1890. So you can see a lot of open space still. And then this is it in 1905. So you can see how developed it got within the, that short period of time. So as we approach 1890, we still have a lot of, Monk the railroads are there already, as you know. Um, they actually, um, as I mentioned, that 70,000 miles of track had been laid and Montclair was the recipient of a good number of them. The first train came through in 1856. Um, the second train line uh, came through uh, in 1873. Um, and the two roads, as you know, will not be connected for a hundred years, but it did provide accessibility into the city, which provided an opportunity for more people to move out this way um, so that they could commute rather than just work close to their homes. Um, but there was still a lot of this around too. Uh, uh, Dr. Watkins, who was a dentist, has written a book, written, wrote a book called Reminiscences of Montclair, and he describes Montclair in uh, 
1896 this way. Uh, Montclair was only a township composed of farms which were practically just beginning to be cut up to smaller plots and have streets um, cut through to accommodate the newcomers. There were great fields and large old orchards. The principal power for the cider mill, cider mill was along Tony's Brook, which is pictured here, where they could be opened for water power. I had to follow a footpath through a cow pasture to reach Lackawanna Station. Between Forest and Park Streets, there were great open orchards and west of Park Street was all open country. Above Fountain Avenue, it was all forest. And uh, some people still had, still had farms and cows, but they primarily accommodated themselves. They were more and more, the newcomers, as Watkins called them, were more and more rely, uh, relying on the dairy farms that were around um, and stores for their primary food sources. Um, and the artist colony, which was in full swing at that point, was relying on the cows as um, great uh, use for literature or for their for their artwork. Um, there were many artists in the who had come to Montclair in the middle of the 19th century. They were attracted by the natural beauty and by the cows, um, but it also uh, provided them an easy way to get into the city so that they can uh, speak to some of their patrons uh, more easily. George Innes arrived in 1884, but there were already plenty of artists here at the time. There were also hotels already here. This is the Mansion House. Um, and the Mansion House is actually, ironically, located right about where the MC Hotel is today. Um, and there was the Mountain House, which uh, was up Bloomfield Avenue. Um, if you go up Bloomfield Avenue into Verona, there's an apartment building on the right-hand side, right opposite Afterglow Avenue. Um, and this is what was there before that apartment building was there. And this is um, Bloomfield Avenue also, uh, right before the 1890s roll around. This is Philip DeRemus's store. Um, and it is on the corner uh, where the Hampton House is today. Um, by 1893, he'd replaced it with this structure. And if you uh, are really watchful, you can see that little triangular dome on top. Um, behind the Hampton House facade. That, so that building is still there. It's just sheathed in the Hampton House facade. Um, and the Montclair Social Club had started up in 1889. It was on Church Street, about where the parking garage is today. Um, it was uh, a men's club, of course. Um, the men could go there to bowl, to play billiards, to read. Um, they had card rooms. Um, they also used a large hall for theater productions, lectures, musical events, and the women were only allowed in. I think this is my favorite part of this club. The women were only allowed in on the men's birthdays. So you begin then to see more and more as we approach 1890. Um, uh, the town is trying to find ways to accommodate this growing population and cater to it. So you begin to see um, more and more houses, businesses, recreational activities, social clubs, schools, social services, churches, and even newspapers. Um, in 1890, there were two newspapers, short-lived, that were founded, the Montclair Herald and the Montclair Journal. Um, lots of buildings. This is an original picture of the Clark House, which is where our administrative offices are now on Orange Road. But also they were not all grand. Um, this is a tenement house that was located on Forest Street and it was owned by Watkins and this picture was taken in 1892. Um, as I mentioned, the Osborne Marcellus uh, was one of the quarries along First Mountain, but there were many more to service um, the community's building needs, especially the gravel roads. Um, interestingly, roads stayed um, dirt when horses were still predominant. By the time cars became more predominant, that's when you begin to see more and more gravel down uh, because the gravel was not as good for the horses as the, as the dirt was. 1890, we see our first police force. Um, we actually had, we're a big enough town that we warranted a full-time constable. That's Henry Gallagher. I'm assuming he's the guy in the middle um, who ultimately became the chief of police. This picture was actually taken in 1898 um, in front of the new police building. 
And then we have these threatening looking gentlemen who are part of the high school football team in 1890. The YMCA starts up in 1891. It's organized by a group of ministers in town. Of course, it was only open to white men. Um, it doesn't look like the one on Park Street because it's not the one on Park Street. It's actually was located on Bloomfield Avenue. It's about where Park Street is today on the, if you're heading west, it's on the left-hand side. Um, and um, it uh, uh, served for a number of years until the YMCA on Park Street was, was built. Um, it was actually just someone's older home that was no longer in use and it was put into service as a YMCA. Uh, Mountainside Hospital was founded in 1891 by this woman, Margaret Jane Power. The story goes that Mrs. Power saw a child tumble from a third floor window and realized there needed to be a place where the child could be cared for. Um, there were plenty of doctors and nurses, private duty doctors and nurses listed in the, um, in the directories, but you needed money for them. So the hospital was founded so that um, it was a place where anyone could go and receive the care they needed. Interestingly, men handled the business end of it, but the women ran the hospital and staff started the nursing school, and it stayed that way until 1928 when there was sort of a coup. And uh, right after that meeting, um, all the men took over the power positions as opposed to the women. Um, and you can see here, um, this is the 1908 directory, but if you look at that directory, it's Mrs. Mrs. Franklin um, Hooper, Mrs. Margaret Jarvie, Miss Kate Dalyrimple. So really fully, um, fully female. The Montclair Athletic Club started, uh, it opened in 1892 in what is now the area by NKA on Valley Road. There was a large field, there were bleachers, they did lawn bowling and lacrosse, uh, there was tobogganing there in the winter. They also had a number of baseball clubs, including um, the Fat Man's Baseball Team, which is one of my favorite, and the Lean Man's Baseball Team. But I think by my ultimate favorite is this group, which is the Petticoat Baseball Team. I guess these men dressed up in their wives' petticoats and came down and played baseball. Um, fire department. Uh, in 1892, the town committee purchased a horse cart, a hose cart and horse from the Newark Fire Department. It became the first one in town to actually own a horse, but the other uh, uh, um, companies followed suit pretty quickly. Um, what I found really interesting about it was there was a huge competition um, among the firemen um, who were all volunteer at the time. Um, and they actually had to publish rules to say that you had to keep off the sidewalks um, while you were responding unless the roads were impassable and muddy. But the competition was to see who could get first on the scene, could arrive first on the scene. So they would literally plow down people and anything in their path in order to actually get there uh, first. Um, in 1894, um, company number two became the first to have a man on duty full time. And, um, as I mentioned, most of the roads were still dirt, and so they would um, have these uh, water wagons that ran around. They were normally for the fire department, but they also, on hot days like today, they'd take the water wagon out and they'd spray down the streets so that they were no longer dusty when you um, took your horse out on them. And uh, Watkins talks about how much the kids love to play behind the water wagons so they could get wet and cool off. This is the Montclair, Montclair Golf Club, opened in 1893 and one of the first golf clubs in um, America. It was originally a nine hole golf course. And in 1893, Miss Mary Weeks, um, it becomes the first librarian of the free public library that has just opened in town. It's located in um, some empty space above Dr. Love's office or uh, medical office on Church Street. Um, and this is Miss Mary Week's sister. And I just show you this because when I found it, I just love the connection. This is her sister walking along. Her name is Clara. They're walking along the street um, in front of their home, probably on Mountain Avenue, now South Mountain near Myrtle. Um, and then the 1900 census, you can actually see down here, it lists Mary as a librarian, which I think is pretty cool. Um, in 1894, a new law is passed that um, 
Nobody mentioned that they love the taxes in Montclair when we talked about what makes Montclair ideal, but this is where it all hails from. Prior to this, um, it used to be that a devoted group of citizens would go out and start just raising money, soliciting money from their friends um, for anything that needed to be done. But in 1894, they actually um, passed a, a law that allowed them to get money um, from the people, to tax people, basically. Um, it was also the year that they formed the township government that divided the town into four wards with representatives from each of the wards. Um, one of the reasons they needed that money was because they opened up this brand new high school in 1894. It was on Valley Road. Um, if you're looking at Hillside School, it's sort of on the um, right-hand side of Hillside School. It was state-of-the-art. It had chemistry labs. It had space for photographic experiments. It had two drinking stations for use by the students. And on the first floor, there were three foot warmers, so arranged so that the children could dry their feet after they'd walked two miles uphill both ways um, in the in the. Excuse first me, Jane. Train. Yes. I think you meant to say it was on Orange Road. Orange Road. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks, Helen. I did. Um, and then this is across the street from that. We probably all recognize that building without the steeple. This was the original high school from 1866 to 1893 until the new high school was built, but it was also the Central School Grammar Building as well. Um, and it is still now being used by the town as the Board of Education. By 1900, and I won't go through all these numbers here, but these are all the schools that are now in place um, in Montclair, uh, plus a few private schools and boarding schools as well. But in the public school system, there were about 2,500 kids. Now, I'm taking this opportunity because I just love some of these pictures of kids from the 1890s. Um, so I'm just going to show you a few of them because we're in the school system. We might as well look at who would have been going there. These are Charles Boucher's kids um, and his calf who came out of the st stable for the, for the, video, for the uh, photograph. Uh, Boucher had a dry goods store, and he lived at 187 North Mountain Avenue. Um, he also had a goat, and this is the kids um, on a goat-drawn wagon with their dog. And these are a group of kids sledding down Claremont Avenue. Can you imagine being able to sled down Claremont Avenue today? Um, these are sledding down Claremont Avenue, and this building on the right-hand side, I believe, is the old Crane Homestead that is reputed to have been uh, George Washington's headquarters. This is um, Montclair's graduating class of 1898, and I include it because if you'll notice, it actually shows um, that there is some diversity in the school. Um, there are two, what appears to be two African-American um, young women, um, one leaning against the column, one sort of right below her. Um, and um, it, really, the fact that the schools were integrated was one of the driving forces that brought um, a lot of people from the south to the north. Um, Eagle Rock Reservation, um, uh, in 1895, the newly formed Essex County Park Commission um, purchased their first property, and it was Eagle Rock Reservation, part of Eagle Rock Reservation. Uh, people were using it before then anyway. Um, there was actually, you can see the trolley lines there that led up to the top of the mountain. Um, there was the overlook there. Um, there was an ice cream pavilion. There was, um, on the other side where Crystal Lake uh, apartments are now, that was still part of the reservation. You could go down and ice skate on the lake. So Eagle Rock Reservation was sort of the precursor to the parks, um, the very beginning of all those parks that we know and love in Montclair today. Restaurant scene, um, some of you mentioned the restaurant scene, not so much back then. Um, there was one restaurant, this is the 1897 directory, there was one restaurant listed, um, Moses, or Victor Moser had a one on 36 Spring Street. Spring Street is down, is, was the old name for the street that where Greek Taverna and Lackawanna Plaza currently are, but there were a bunch of saloons, uh, naturally, and my favorite is the fact that there was actually an Egan saloon back then. So I don't believe it's related, but I love the fact that there was an Egan's even back then. Um, and there were loads of clubs that you could belong to. Um, there was uh, clubs for just about everything, um, book clubs, 
nature clubs, um, children rare, child rearing clubs. The three o'clock club is still in existence today. Um, there were societies, secret and benevolent, as it says in the paper or in the diction or directory. What I love about it is how secret can they be if they're in the directory? Um, there were other societies and clubs, countless ones. You'll notice also that there's the Wheelman Club. That's the bicycle club because bicycles were a huge thing back then. Um, and there were tons and tons of churches. Um, there were 19 in all. Um, and you'll notice that, um, I'll just read a few. The First Baptist Church on South Fullerton. Um, St. Paul's is open and you'll see in parentheses, it says colored next to that. Um, if you go way down to the bottom, you actually see one at the very, very bottom that says it's the Swedish Lutheran Church. So why so many churches? Well, first of all, there were a lot of different denominations um, um, and people were attending them regularly. And so um, a lot of different um, denominations, uh, you needed the Lutheran, the Catholic, the Episcopal, the Presbyterian, the Congregational. Um, so you needed all of those different churches but also everybody was walking to them. So you couldn't very well have a church at one end of town and not at the other. You needed to make it convenient for your parishioners to get to. So location was really important. And as we saw birds of a feather flock together, whether rightly or wrongly, um, you find that the different groups wanted to worship together. So for example, with the Catholic churches, um, uh, Mount Carmel won't be created for another decade at least, but um, the Immaculate Conception was founded for really the Irish immigrants who had come into town. And then when Immaculate or when Mount Carmel was founded, it really catered to the Italian community that had my, immigrated to, to Montclair. So you um, have these different groups worshiping together. Um, and then the trolley arrived in 1898. Um, you can see this here on Bloomfield Avenue now. This is actually a little bit later photo, but it's one of the best ones we have of the trolley. Um, what I love about the trolley story is that they wanted to put in a trolley that started in Newark and went all the way you know, out to Caldwell and, and beyond. And um, Montclair didn't want it. They would have nothing of it. And so they put in the trolley that stopped at the edge of Montclair. Um, for the first year of the trolley's existence, people had to get off the trolley, get onto a wagon, get carried on the horse-drawn wagon through to the end of Montclair, get off the horse-drawn wagon, and then back onto the trolley, which would take them out to the rest of, the, um, the rest of their destinations. Uh, that lasted about one year, and Montclair, I think, realized how silly this was and wound up agreeing to put the trolley in. Uh, it officially opened in 1898. Um, we also have the public library moving uh, now to the Old Munn Tavern, um, and they established themselves there until the Carnegie Library was opened um, on Church and Valley. Um, and then 1898, we also see the end of the Spanish, well, the beginning and the end of the Spanish-American War. Uh, Montclair has loved parades. Uh, I know it was sorely missed this year. This is one that celebrated the end of the Spanish-American War in 1898. Um, that's Company K. And um, they marched through town. And then I believe they probably ended theirs with the parade with festivities on the Board of Ed properties. And I loved this picture because of um, what you can see with the, you can see the board building so beautifully um, there. And um, then this one is also on the street. And the reason I really was taken to this one is we haven't mentioned um, the Hui family, um, which was one of the very first African-American families to move north to Montclair as part of the Great Migration. And um, they worked really hard to get themselves out of the servant class. And they owned a newsstand. Now this is right on Bloomfield Avenue um, at the intersection of all those corners where, the, where the, um, the bank was, that's now the Italian food place. But these are, I believe, the Huey brothers standing on top of their newsstand building. So um, really quite remarkable picture that we have. And you can see them right there. Um, so by the end of the 19, or by the end of the 1890s, um, this is what Montclair is looking like. Now, kind of 
think of how that looked. Think of how that very first Dorema store looked. Um, that looked like something out of the Old West, really. This is where we are today. You now have the trolley. Um, bicycles are a huge thing. The buildings along uh, uh, Bloomfield Avenue make it look much like it does today. Lots of stores. Um, I can't, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the, um, this building itself. It, it wasn't, it was actually uh, built in 1899 um, and it was built by Seymour Crane. And what's not there today is really the best part of the building. Up on top, you can see there's a clock and then the clock, instead of it reading one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, it reads Seymour Crane. And whatever happened to that clock, I have no idea, um, but it's a pity that it's no longer there. If you're interested in learning more about Montclair history, these are some of my sources, not all of them. Um, the Montclair Public Libraries um, Montclair History Online Database is a huge resource. Um, most of the pictures came from there. The few that didn't came from our own online postcard database, which you can find on our website. Um, I Probably Watkins is one of my favorites. Um, it was written in 1929, but it's the most folksy and it kind of tells you the most um, um, uh, anecdotal stories as well. I think it really brings to life a lot of uh, what Montclair was like between the ice skating and the, um, the, the men who would go racing down Bloomfield Avenue at three o'clock in the afternoon um, as races. Uh, you know, they were actually drag racing with their horses at three o'clock in the afternoon um, on Bloomfield Avenue. So he's got a lot of wonderful stories in there. And then the Nolan uh, plan is kind of an interesting one. It was a town plan that was looked at as a way to make Montclair as beautiful as it possibly could. And most of the things didn't get enacted in it, but it sort of has really interesting pictures of that period. Um, so with that, I am going to stop my share and ask if there are any questions. And I'm really glad that Mike and Helen are on because they're gonna help me answer them if I can't get them, so. I'm gonna let Mike answer the first one about where was the Munn Tavern and what's there now? Oh, Mike, go for that. You can talk about all the moves it made. There you go. I did, thank you. The Munn Tavern was originally um, it was on Church Street, and it was moved uh, when they built the first uh, uh, Carnegie Library, which is now part of the um, uh, Unitarian Church. That roundish, roundish building, uh, which is the Unitarian Church. Um, I guess that's their their community building. Mm -hmm. And that is where the Munn Tavern was originally. Uh, it was then moved, uh, when that the Carnegie Library was built, that's when they moved it behind the, uh, what was the uh, Swedish Evangelical Church. Uh, it became a Christian Evangelical Church, and I don't know what it is now. I mean, they closed up the congregation uh, it became the parish hall for that church. I don't think there's anything there now. Uh, uh, Elaine? Yes, um, the building originally, I can just go back a little bit because that was my church. Um, Mrs. Christina Johnson, who was a young widow, worked for the Board of Education and she asked if she could move it about 1902. And it was dragged behind the property and settled on her land. And she had, um, the church building was there in 1895 but she had this building put back there in, in 1902. And then she donated her front yard for the manse for the church. But um, right now it was sold to a family that is, has connections with the uh, Shanghai Trio, I believe, from Montclair State. And they are we're planning to open a music center and nothing has happened yet as far as in, since 2013 or so. So I don't know its status, but it's supposed to be a future music and art center. Okay. Yeah, it's tough to see it now. You have to sort of go into the back of Dunkin' Donuts parking lot and peer over in order to see it. Right. Yeah, you got a good view there. And of course then, I mean, that was because Bloomfield Avenue didn't exist there. Church Street was part of the old road from Newark, and that was the place to have 
a tavern. As soon as Bloomfield Avenue went in, Munn built another tavern on Bloomfield Avenue, which became the mansion house that you showed. Um, I wanted to mention, thank you, Mike, at the end, um, some of the things that we talked about in the beginning, um, you know, of what makes Montclair special. They didn't fall within the 1890s uh, time frame, but just by 1910, many of the parks that we know of, Anderson Park, for example, had been um, founded. Montclair State was founded as Montclair Normal School. The new library that we just talked about um, was, was put in. Uh, the Commonwealth Club was in place. Montclair Art Museum was now in place. Immaculate Conception had been founded. And probably my favorite thing is clearly cars, uh, which is always an issue in Montclair, um, were making the scene because the first automobile carnival with 116 cars in parade um, was held um, in 1910. So um, there, is, there is a continuation of all that good stuff. So other questions? Hello. Mike, can you, can you answer the one about, somebody's asking about the town pools history. I've heard anecdotally, but do you know more definitively about the history of the town pools? I don't know more definitively about that. I know there is an article that was written on them by a student that is available online that you can look for to see. Um, um, and I know that they were segregated, but other than that, I really don't know a lot about when they went in. Mike, do you know anything about them? No. Sorry. Yeah, I had heard from somebody who grew up near the mountainside pool. That, you know, they went in in the 60s and um, yeah, they were three different pools and, and, you know, south end, middle and north end of town, which sort of was de facto segregation. So, yeah, I remember that. <clears throat> I remember when they built the pool, but the disappointing, because I went to the one at M Mountainside Park, but the disappointing thing was that it was rather shallow. You know, you couldn't dive in. <laughs> oh, now you can. Are they still? <laughs> are they still in now? I think you can dive in. Now. No, they're okay. still shallow. No. They're, they're, they are they shallow? Okay, I guess you can jump. Five feet. You can maybe. jump in, yeah. <laughs> you can jump, but you can't well, dive in. If the if the lifeguards aren't watching, you can jump in. Oh, okay. Are they still there? <laughs> All the pools are still there, no. and they're actually no. opening this summer. Oh, that's good. There were there were four pools uh, originally. There was an above ground pool in Glenfield Park, huh. which was vandalized the first summer that it opened and was then destroyed. I know, I, I grew up in Bloomfield and Watsessing Park had one of those pools in the 50s. And because Glenfield was, at that point was a county park, I think, that um, maybe it still is, I don't know. Um, but I think that was the same kind of pool. It was just a wading pool, like knee high. Was there any opposition to overdevelopment um, in town in the 1890s as there is today? I have not seen it. Um, yeah, what I've seen more is that um, there was almost a, we welcome the people in with their new ideas. Um, so I, I don't see that opposition to development at all um, in what I've read in the Montclair Times or what I've read in any of the books. Um, what I find so interesting though is you know, it, there's so, there are so many parallels. The railroads go through and things get developed. And then the Montclair connection happens. And then we now see another huge period of development. And so I, I found that that correlation was really fascinating. Yeah, except for the opposition. To, from well, the opposition there. is the difference, right? Yes. <laughs> um, I have a question about the high schools. Yes. Um, of course, the month. The <laughs> The big Montclair High School I'm aware of was built like 1914. 14, yeah. Right, and then, but before that, Jane, you showed a, the previous high school that was built not much long, like what, in the 1890s. So why did they, what happened to that school and why did they build the newest one? Well, that school was way too small. <laughs> it was a wonderful school, state of the art, as Jane said, way too small for the increasing population. Yeah, that's what was pretty shocking how, um, what a short time that it was up. And actually, that is something that I have seen in researching is, you know, sort of just shocked at how little time, like, it would be like, all right, we're knocking this down, we're building something else, or we're moving this, or we're, you know, things, I think things changed a lot um, with little, you know, 
you know, that was poor planning, but it's like, well, they couldn't have, they did use it as an elementary school for a while before they knocked it down, but still it was supposedly state of the art. Right. Couldn't you put an addition on it? Do you, do you think yeah. that because there were many more private schools for the upper grades, like high school? What do you mean? Well, people went, would, places like MKA, private schools that are, are, did more high school kids go there so they, they didn't have to build as big as, as they did for the elementary population? I, I mean, there were private schools and a lot of kids went to them, but I think it was just a, a huge influx of people. There was just more people than they anticipated, way more. The growth was too fast. So they built a new high school that uh, amazingly is still there since yeah. 1915. Mm -hmm. And still, well, with some stairs falling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Forgotten in town is Randall Spaulding. Oh. Randall Spaulding was the principal and the man behind that new high school on Orange Road. He well, was that was named for him. He was a phenomenal man. He was a photographer. He was an educator that brought things like manual training to town. And he's kind of overlooked, but I've always admired him. And I think more should be said about Randall Spaulding. Well, he was the superintendent for many years of the yes. district, I think, right? And, and well, John uh, Love was the president. John Love was the president of the school board. He was the superintendent. If you walk into the new high school, there's a bronze plaque commemorating Spaulding. Oh. At the high school that Jane talked about was named the Spalding High School. No, no I, Mike, I think it was named Spalding there when it became an elementary school. You know, I think, you know, I, I think you're right, Helen. I think you're right. I, I'm going like, to retract my statement. It was but you're right. It, Elaine, he's worth actually probably a blog post or an article. Anything else? Well, thank you all for coming. Two weeks, we do Scientific American, and um, I appreciate everybody coming and your kind words. Thanks an awful lot, everybody. Take care.